So most of the time when talking about a band like Rush, the conversation typically either goes like this, oh, you mean the band with the best drummer in the world, or man, I love those, their concept albums from the 70s, like 2112 and, and Hemispheres. And although you could argue that those albums are probably the peak of Rush's musical chops, I think on a purely conceptual narrative level, I think there is one other Rush concept album that kind of slips under the radar for most Rush fans. And it goes well beyond the singular themes of 2112 and Hemispheres. And no, I'm not talking about Caress of Steel. I'm talking about Clockwork Angels. What makes Clockwork Angels a unique case when compared to most concept albums, which mainly focus on the emotions of the individual or a loose collection of topics strung together by one overall theme, Clockwork Angels instead creates a sense of storytelling that feels more linear and episodic in nature. You see, the entire album is actually one giant story of a man's life from late adolescence all the way to the end, with the character's wisdom growing along the way. Every song, a separate individual story within the characters walk through life inside the steampunk world he inhabits. It's quite an engaging way to tell a story and gives the album a chance to draw many parallels with the trials and tribulations we all endure in life, and the album is intentionally designed to be this way. But if you want to learn more about the entire story itself, I would highly recommend purchasing a copy of the Clockwork Angels novelization. It's a complete literary telling of the story with all of the attention to detail that an album can't show in lyrics and song. Written by Neil himself along with co-writer and science fiction author Kevin J. Anderson, it is honestly not only a great companion piece to the album, but also a great book in general, but I digress. Every song in Clockwork Angels is like a chapter in a book, exploring the character's thoughts about himself, his path in life, beliefs, questions, and opinions about the steampunk world he lives in as well as his interactions within it. Speaking of steampunk, let's quickly explain what I mean by that. Much like the cyberpunk worlds we tend to see in Hollywood blockbusters, steampunk is a vision of the future with a twist. Instead of the advanced technology we see being powered by forms of electricity like hovering spaceships and artificial intelligence such as robots, imagine the future as viewed from the past. Steampunk relies on advanced technology derived from the 19th century, such as steam-powered machinery, clockwork mechanics, and alchemy. This gives the record a different feeling when compared to other futuristic concept albums in circulation today, which focus on spacey electronic sounds to put the listener in the album's futuristic world, instead of reminding the listener of a time that has since passed. In the first song, Caravan, the protagonist describes the steampunk world he lives in as living in a world lit only by fire, a long train of flares and their piercing stars. I stand watching the steamliners roll by. This sets the listener right into the world of the character by describing what the character sees. By acknowledging what type of world this is set in, it helps legitimize the use of samples as more than sound effects, but all as tools to help ease the listener into the world writer Neil Peart describes in the lyrics. In other words, the use of sound effects as well as alluding to it in the lyrics are what helps sell the immersion into the world itself within Clockwork Angels. Although some might find the sound effects to be gimmicky out of the context from the story, it all makes sense in the world for them to be included as references to the steampunk world Peart described in his lyrics. But these allusions to the steampunk world are only used as a way of keeping the individual topics and themes in every song sprung together by the world's aesthetic, so the steampunk atmosphere doesn't distract from the lessons and themes within the album itself. Where the steampunk lyrics and sound effects help elevate the immersion into the story, the lessons within each song are what stand as a true monumental testament to the writing abilities of Neil Peart. This album not only represents the story of the characters walk through life, but the bands and the listeners as well, such as in the track BU2B. The protagonist discusses the idea of being indoctrinated into a faith or belief system through one's surroundings, as well as the alienation that can come from being one of the few who realize this indoctrination for what it is brainwashing. This is quite obviously based on the thoughts Neil had from his own life experience of being raised in Sunday school as a Christian and being chastised for questioning the faith he was expected to blindly follow. It could even be interpreted as a jab against the mainstream press, who will listen and enjoy whatever they are told to because it's popular at the time, and will try and tell you what's good or bad to listen to. But I don't think that was Neil's goal with this song, though many of his other works demonstrate this message with a much clearer symbolism. 
but this sense of ambiguity in the lyrics are more than likely alluding to the idea of blind faith with the watchmaker being the representation of God within the story. Another example of this kind of reflection between the story and the band itself can be found in the song Headlong Flight, a seven minute bombastic tune with many little musical nods to Rush's previous riffs and songs. The lyrics can be seen as both a reflection of the character's view of his own life after all he's been through, as well as the band's reflection of their career after 40 years as a band, with lines such as, all the journeys of this great adventure, it didn't always feel that way, and, I have stoked the fire on the big steel wheels, steer the airship right across the stars. I learned to fight, I learned to love, I learned to feel. Oh, I wish that I could live it all again. This all shows Neil's, I mean, the character's, acknowledgement of the life he's led, his acceptance of all the good and the bad, and even his sense of pride in all that he has done, boasting, I wish that I could live it all again. Although Neil admitted to having never wanted to live his whole life over again, I think it's safe to say he still tried to convey the sense of pride one feels when remembering the entirety of their own life. To me, this style of songwriting throughout the album gives it an almost dual narrative when analyzing the album from both the story and the band's mentality when crafting the record. It's almost as if the album was made to act as the cap off to Rush's career, a sort of reflection of themselves through the events of the story. This gives Clockwork Angels a unique quality, where the listener can either listen to it to reflect on themselves or reflect on the band's career through the story's obvious parallels with Russia's own trials and tribulations throughout the decades. One rather strange and coincidental fact about the career of Rush is their association with gardens. One of the earliest songs Rush wrote in their infancy was entitled Garden Road, a blues rock jam perfect for the style of original drummer John Rutsey. Although the song never made it onto an album, bootleg recordings of the band from their early days touring in the early 70s with John Rutsey and eventually Neil himself show what the song might have sounded like if it had made it onto a record. But as the band has stated in subsequent interviews, the song simply felt too much like a basic blues rock song for their liking by the time Neil Getty and Alex had begun work on their more progressive follow-up album, Fly By Night. Now what does this have to do with Clockwork Angels? I believe Garden Road acts as an example of youthful songwriting that only hungry young musicians can really write with earnest sincerity. Much like the final track on Clockwork Angels, The Garden, acts as an example of wise songwriting only musicians who have made a career out of philosophizing ideas and music for decades could write with the same sincerity. The best way to simplify this thought is to imagine all of the old rock bands of the past releasing new songs today about the same partying, sex, drugs, and rock and roll they wrote about in their youth in a vain attempt to preserve that sense of youth. Or another example would be when you see a young and up-and-coming songwriter trying to write the next Stairway to Heaven using the cliches they've heard a million times as their form of philosophizing. It all comes off as just cringy and almost never manages to deliver the same impact it was intended to. The difference between those artists and Rush is the sincerity within Rush's songwriting all throughout their career. In other words, when Rush was a young band, the subject matter of their songwriting to some degree always reflected that sense of youthfulness, because that's exactly what they were. And the same can be said about the end of their career. It's actually quite ironic that one of the first songs the band ever wrote happens to share a title with the last song they ever wrote, yet the subject matter and style of the song has changed so drastically due to the time passed and wisdom gained. A weird coincidence, but I believe it to be a coincidence nonetheless. Although Rush aren't the only band to have a song titled The Garden, or for that matter, the only band to have written a song about the metaphorical garden of life, I think Neil is the only lyricist to really make the old parable ring with such truth. I suppose I should let Neil himself explain. What do you lack? Those fateful words, what do you lack, spark an inner monologue about all that I have lost. No more boundless optimism, no more faith in greater powers, too much pain, too much grief, and too much disillusion. Despite all that, I realize the great irony that although I now believe only in the exchange of love, even that little faith follows the childhood reflex that I was brought up to believe. Victimized, bereaved, and disappointed, seemingly at every turn, I still resist feeling defeated or cynical. I have come to believe that anger and grudges are burning embers in the heart, not worth carrying through life. Our character finds himself at the end of all these tribulations where everything that he was brought up to believe has come under fire and really has been shattered for him, basically, in this case. And it's the nexus at which he turns to his own resources and his own 
experience and he holds on to some faith in the exchange of love like i said in the little prose preamble but he has to know how to deal with all these negative feelings and all these negative people that have been basically assaulting him throughout the story so that leads perfectly into the wish them well thing because i think that's a really important realization in life that all you can do with these people is turn your back and walk away be glad you're not that way and wish them well and and that translates even wider among the leaders and people that are trying to do something in the world wish them well you know it's hard to understand all the negativity that goes out through all the avenues of the media and the interweb and all of that where these people are just fulminating full of poison and toxic anger and all that when really that's a much healthier way if something really annoys you and you can get away from it get away from it if somebody's trying to do something to the best of their ability for everyone's benefit then wish them well the culmination of my own experience my own thinking and resolutions I, I think wish them well is just a resolution that we should try to do and I think you can learn healthier ways to respond to negativity like that and to toxic people you know like I said earlier if you can't avoid them you're not turning the other cheek because you're not going to stay there and be abused right you're going to say okay bye-bye I'm glad I'm not like you I am gone right because it's hard when someone is attacking you not to defend yourself and uh, if I guess but I guess the ideal is if you can extricate yourself from the situation do it yeah if you can yeah and don't waste your energy too on returning grudges and hatred and uh, you know the, the negative feelings that only poison you that's one thing I, I've always hated about the feeling of anger it leaves me with such a ha hangover after if I get mad at someone right. even in traffic you know even if I'm like today on my bicycle and somebody you know gratuitously cuts me off and that anger that you can carry isn't good for you and it doesn't help the situation one bit so if you can learn to just say okay you're a jerk bye you're right. not in my life it's almost like uh, racism the the racist is carrying that around all the time but um, he may not even know that uh, the people that he's uh, uh, you know putting his hate on to they may not even know it and they are not they are not causing it yes They're people have this anger and this frustration and again the story's woven with that the anarchist is an extreme example but everyone does have that everyone has the scars of anger and frustration and dissatisfaction with their own lives and then they project them on someone else right. and blame them and another bit of wisdom I've learned along the way that if someone that you care about wants something you have to help them get it this was the culmination of the whole story really and the culmination of of my story in many ways Long ago, I read a story from another timeline about a character named Candide. He also su survived a harrowing series of misadventures and tragedies, then settled on a farm near Constantinople. Listening to a philosophical rant, Candide replied, That is all very well, but now we must tend our garden. The immediate thing to notice about the song's message is the sense of wisdom Neil seems to be trying to convey. This idea that one's life and interactions with others is meant to be cared for with the same gentle sensitivity that one must exhibit when tending to a garden. I think this lesson could really be taken to heart in this day and age. When divisiveness seems to be the norm, this kind of wisdom just seems so poignant to leave as a final lesson from the professor himself. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. Uh, this took me quite a lot of time to make, so leaving a like and a comment would definitely be appreciated. And uh, if you want to see more content like this in the future, why not consider subscribing? I'm looking to do more album analysis content like this in the future, so hopefully you guys will enjoy seeing more of that. But either way, until next time, peace.